ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Imagine a solar farm so big you can see it from space. Well, Aussie billionaire Mike Cannon-Brooks has been given the green light to build it in the Northern Territory. The catch is some of the power it produces would be exported to Singapore. Today, Giles Parkinson, founder and editor of reneweconomy.com.au on what will be the biggest renewable project in the world. I'm Sam Hawley on Gadigal land in Sydney. This is ABC News Daily. Giles, in the Northern Territory, there's this huge pastoral station, which I assume was once upon a time used for herding cattle. It's government land leased out. Just tell me about that property and where it is. Yeah, so it's near a place called Elliot, which I think um, I've never been there, so I'm not really too sure how big Elliot is, but I suspect it's just a dot on the map. It's about 800 kilometres south of Darwin, and it's located there because the big solar project that they want to build does not want to be interfered with by clouds and monsoons, so that's a reasonably dry and sunny area outside of the monsoon range. Yeah, sure. So it's pretty sunny there most of the time and it's really hot, let's face it. Yes, yeah, especially now. Yes, exactly. Well, this land, of course, is potentially about to become very lucrative. So let's forget about cattle. As you say, a solar farm is going to be placed on it. It'll be so big, apparently, that you'll be able to see it from space. Yes, well, that's what they say. Yes, it's um, it's, it's going to be huge. And the chances are it's not just going to be solar as well. The The original plan was for 20 gigawatts of solar, which, to put that into perspective, is equal to the amount of all the solar panels that have been put on rooftops on the households and businesses in Australia over the last decade. But they've kind of had a bit of a look at the project. So the actual solar component may still only be half that size, but still considerable, like 10 gigawatts of, of solar, which, I mean, you know, a gigawatt doesn't mean much, I guess, to sort of casual listeners, but it is more than the installed capacity of all large sales solar farms in wow. Australia up till now. And they're now thinking of adding a wind component because they think that by having more energy produced at night, which, which of course solar can't do, then that is going to improve the economics of the project. But they haven't quite landed on the exact design of that component yet. Mm, All right. Well, it's going to be the world's biggest solar farm, something like 12,000 hectares of PV panels. It's it's, it's just huge. Like it's just this, it'll just go on forever. Look, I once drove past a 500 megawatt solar farm in California. So what's that? Like sort of one twentieth of the size of this. And I was going along a highway at about 100 kilometres an hour, and I just felt like I was going for about 10 or 15 minutes before I got from one end to the other end. So that's how big it is. And so just imagine just going on for half an hour or whatever. I mean, it's just, yeah, just phenomenal in size. Yes, it's yes. Incredible, yeah. And it's going to be the world's biggest renewable energy project. A really fascinating thing, of course, Giles, about this is it's actually being built in part to help the Singaporeans. So just tell me about that. Yeah, the project was conceived, as others have been, but this one is still very determined to try and do this, try and provide sort of cheap or lower cost power to to city states like Singapore or other states in Southeast Asia who don't necessarily have the sort of the land mass or the wind resource to be able to go renewable. And in the case of Singapore, it's heavily dependent on gas and it's heavily dependent on imported gas. And that's really expensive. So the idea here is to build this massive solar farm in the heart of the Northern Territory, build this huge transmission lines which will take it to Darwin, and then through various converter stations, put it through a subsea cable Mm. that will go 4,300 kilometres from Darwin, wind its way through the Indonesian archipelago, and then land at Singapore and provide power to them. 
you can just imagine the complexity of that project, just from sort of economics, but also technical and political, all sorts of different levels. It's just mind boggling in its ambition, but we are starting to see these sorts of projects happen in shorter distances but quite often now you start to see them happening in Europe where you've got links between the continent and the UK and Ireland and up to Norway. These sorts of projects, which is just the whole concept of sort of sharing cheaper renewable power from a place that has a really good resource and sort of sending it to a place which doesn't have that resource. Yeah, a 4,000 kilometre subsea cable sounds... What could go wrong? <laughs> I was about to say it sounds very ambitious. I assume that's a cable that just sits on the floor of the ocean, does it? Or do they dig it in? No, no, it sort of sits on the floor of the ocean. It's a bit yeah. like, look, Australia already has one going from Tasmania to the mainland and is about to build another one and was planning to build another two, but in the end it's just going to build one called the Marinus Link. So, yeah, these are not infallible pieces of equipment, but then neither is overhead transmission. So, Giles, the sun will be shining down on this solar farm, this huge solar farm on a pastoral station in the Northern Territory, and that's going to help power Singapore. So our sun, if we can put it that way, it's the sun shining on our ground, will basically help Singapore in its transition to renewables. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it won't be wholly dependent on this cable and this this sun, but it might source, say, 15 and 20% of its electricity needs from the, from this cable. I want to talk with you, Giles, soon about whether this is really good for us as a nation. Some people might be questioning why we're assisting Singapore when we could have better connections to solar ourselves at this point. But first, on this project, there is massive money, of course, involved, upwards of $35 billion. It's been a pretty long journey and it's involved, hasn't it, a couple of Aussie billionaires. Yes, well, look, I mean, one of the interesting things about the renewable industry is a bit like sort of a sport. It sort of involves sort of, you know, big plans, big money, big egos and sort of interesting technology and stuff like that. And that's exactly what we had here. So Andrew Forrest is the head of Fortescue Metals and now a green energy advocate, one of Australia's richest men, was involved in this project, as was Mike Cannon-Brooks, the software billionaire, who's also very much a green energy advocate and also one of the country's richest men. Now, they both were involved in the early stages, putting in money, and they gladly joined the front of this project. And then, well, then they had different views about what was feasible and what was not feasible. Mm -hmm. Andrew Forrest did not seem to like the idea about this subsea cable to Singapore. He did not think that stacked up. And he wanted to sort of direct the project towards the domestic market and specifically green hydrogen. Whereas Mike Cannon-Brooks kept on with the idea that no, we think it can support both green manufacturing in Darwin, which remains an important component of the project, but also this subsea cable to Singapore. Mm, all right, well, billionaires don't necessarily all think alike, obviously. <laughs> no, well, they, they had a bit of a bidding contest. So what happened was that they couldn't agree on the funding and what the future of the project was. So had a bit of argument and then it went out to some sort of tender and um, the upshot of it was that Cannon Brooks won that tender and he's now in control of that project. All right, well, Andrew Forrest is out. Cannon Brooks is still in. So this project is going ahead regardless of any misgivings surrounding it because the Environment Minister, Tanya Plebisect, approved the project last week. It is really transformative for the Northern Territory. It'll generate jobs, it'll bring wealth, it'll give us uh, whole new export industries from the Northern Territory. So when will this mega solar farm be up and running, do we know? Well, it's going to be a few years yet. They're expecting to reach a financial investment decision by 2027. Mm -hmm. So that's still three years away. And then it will take another year for them to reach what's called financial close. Yeah. 
and then they hope they can do that in 2028. So then they've got all the funding lined up for the project, and then they will start construction. And then it might not actually be complete or start generating its first power and transmitting it and transporting it to Darwin until the early 2030s. And there's lots of things to be lined up here, because even though we've talked about Singapore, the first stage of the project is very much focused on Darwin mm -hmm. and supplying green industries in the Darwin area and the Middle Arm precinct. But those industries don't exist yet. So they've basically got to find some potential customers who will buy that power. Because at that point, building a big solar farm and no one's going to buy the output because it's just this multitude bigger than what the Darwin city demand is. So they've been told and they've started to talk with potential customers who will build factories or processing plants or whatever it might be in Darwin, attracted by the port facilities and this promise of low cost and clean power. And so they will have to get those agreements in place and they will have to get those facilities built. So a, you can just sort of imagine just like, you know, just the sort of all the pieces moving around in this jigsaw and they've all got to kind of fit together at the same time. So yeah, it, it, just the whole logistics of the whole thing is just, just extraordinary, really. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Giles, Darwin and Singapore will potentially benefit from this, but as you say, it's a very long project, so it's got a way to go yet. But I guess the question in some people's minds is, if we can help nations like Singapore in its transition to renewables, as you say, powering 15% of Singapore through this, you know, huge, huge solar farm, why can't we do the same here? Why can't we have a cable linking a solar farm in the Northern Territory to a city like Sydney or Melbourne? Well, we could. It's just the cost. Now, if you were thinking about building Sun Cable and then string a transition line to Sydney, you can do that, you know, engineering-wise and technology, that's no problem. Will it supply power at a lower cost? Well, that's debatable. However, one of the interesting things that came out of a, um, a report last week from one of the big transmission companies, now, of course, the transmission company has a self-interest in wanting to build transmission lines, so you have to sort of take it, you know, everyone, they're sort of pushing the right envelope here. But they were talking about sending transmission lines out to the far west of New South Wales because the resource there is greater and bringing in wind and solar from those distances. So there you're talking distances of, say, 500 or 1,000 kilometres rather than three or 4,000 kilometres. So that's another possibility. Well, the government, of course, says it will make us a renewable hub for the world. But my question is, is that good for us? Do you think it's good for us to build these massive solar farms and really power other nations? Oh, definitely. I mean, Australia's economy at the moment is heavily dependent on fossil fuel exports. We're one of the three biggest fossil fuel exporters, you know, coal and gas in particular. That's not going to last forever because the world will stop buying it as they transition to sort of clean energy. So Australia needs to replace those imports somehow. We've got this fantastic wind and solar resource. So this is just, you know, having a, a line strung from Australia to another country like Singapore is just one of the opportunities that are being sort of identified for us to become a green energy exporter. Then we could become a big base for green energy and green products. So people are talking about green iron, sort of fertilizers and, you know, aluminium and steel. You know, there's all sorts of possibilities and a lot of work needs to be done on that, but that is the vision. And that'd be good for Australia because inevitably that will allow for cheaper power within Australia because just the sheer scale of these developments, you know, the savings from, from, from that scale will be quite considerable. The commodity, once you've actually built those plants, is essentially free. It comes from the wind, it comes from the sun. So do you think, Giles, that this project is really viable or will Andrew Forrest's concerns turn out to be founded? It is a, as we said, 4,000 kilometre cable under the water. What could possibly go wrong? They've invested, look, it must be at least $100 million. It's probably going on to $200 million. They obviously think that it could potentially stack up. So, no, we don't know that, yes, it will be built and that it will work, but they sure as heck obviously think there's still a chance that it will, and, and they're investing a lot of their own money into giving it a red hot crack. 
Giles Parkinson is the founder and editor of reneweconomy.com.au. This episode was produced by Sydney Peed, Cara Jensen McKinnon, and Anna John. Audio production by Sam Dunn. Our supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Sam Hawley. To get in touch with the team, please email us on ABC News Daily at abc.net.au. Thanks for listening.